All right, good evening. Welcome to UPARS Los Angeles. My name is Steve Murillo. I'm the director for UPARS. And uh, we have a very, very interesting speaker with us tonight, Lisette Larkins. Uh, Lisette is going to be talking to you folks about the subject of contact. And she's had very direct experience with that, as I'm sure some of you in the room have. And that experience is not always the same for everybody. Sometimes it can be very positive and sometimes it can be very negative. And it depends on, I don't know really, I haven't quite decided what it depends on yet. But uh, because it, it varies. I haven't, I haven't found a pattern to that yet. It doesn't seem to uh, have a pattern. But at any rate, Lisette um, started to experience things when she was a young mom uh, in 1987. She started to receive contact. And at the time, if, it, if it's foreign to you, it's very hard to put in uh, any kind of context that you can understand or that fits into the normal reality. And so oftentimes contactees and abductees will feel like they are about to, uh, to go off the deep end. And I'm sure there was a little of that in, in Lisette's life as she uh, wrestled with the subject and wrestled with what was happening to her. But without uh, taking anything further from her, I would just like to uh, welcome Lisette Larkins uh, up to the podium to speak. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, I appreciate that. Thanks for coming. Hello. Contact, of course, is always perceived through the eyes of the well, the contactee, of course, but then so are all experiences with respect to everything that we're going through. And I guess I just have to kind of start at the beginning for me. I was not raised in a kind of a family that discussed these kinds of experiences. I wasn't raised in a kind of environment in which it was even considered possible. I never really thought about it as a child until I was about seven years old and I had my first contact experience. And I didn't know how to contextualize it. I was just a, a young child, of course. But I remember just constantly staring into the sky in my classroom and not being able to focus on my studies because I was just mesmerized by the wonder of my contact. I wasn't frightened by it. And I didn't know until many years later that my sister would regularly see crafts, um, alien crafts, over our house. This was in Santa Monica, California, close by. And so that, that contact stuck with me. But then as the years went by, I f kind of forgot all about it. And then f fast forward all the way to the time I was a young mother, it was 1987. I had just given birth to a, a, a young son. And it was about eight months into his life. And I was really struggling with difficulties. I was, of course, a new mother. I was in a relatively new marriage. I was married to somebody who, at the time, um, we had just kind of been through the, the experience of... Um, the, the military, he was a military officer, so he had very linear thinking, and here I am, um, really humbled by the difficulties in my life, really humbled. And so I found, I really didn't have, even though I was raised Catholic as a young girl, I wasn't religious at that point in my life. And I really didn't have a specific God of my understanding, only just that there was something. There was some kind of supreme being. So I started to pray very fervently at that period of my life because I was desperately looking. I was desperately searching. And what happened, my, my then husband was traveling a lot. And he traveled on business, and I had just put my son down to sleep. And I was in my bedroom and remember the context, I'm in, I'm, I'm really looking for answers, asking to be shown the way. And so I would consider looking back that it was a time when I was spiritually very vulnerable, as we always are when we're really open. Sometimes, you know, we're close to things, but I was open, looking, just show me the way. I don't know what it is, somebody, somebody, somewhere. So I had just gotten my son to sleep, and I had gotten into bed with a book, and I was starting to read, 
And I heard this low humming sound in the room. And I really didn't know what it was. And so I kind of put the book down and I lay back to listen to it. And my first thought that was that it was a police helicopter. Kind of the sound, you know, this was in Los Angeles, that it was a police helicopter and that maybe there was a burglary and there were, you know, there was a helicopter looking for somebody and it got louder and louder until it was deafening. And I thought, and I was looking around trying to figure out, and I started to get up, but I found that I really couldn't move. I could only stay where I was in the bed. And at that point, my thoughts turned to my son in his crib, but I, I wasn't able to go to help him. For some mysterious reason, I was just frozen in my bed. And this loud sound continued until it was deafening. And I thought this police helicopter perhaps was landing on the roof. That's all I could think about. I really didn't know what it was. And I started to notice that as the, la the sound became louder and louder, that all this phenomena just erupted. So, for example, at the time I had very long hair, and my long hair was blowing around my face. And yet I looked across the room, and the draperies against the windows were perfectly still. So it didn't really make any sense to me at all how that could happen. And it was just deafening. It, it began to sound as though a locomotive train was coming through the bedroom. It was that loud. It was ear-shattering. At which point, I started to feel sleepy. And I thought, how can I feel sleepy? Because my heart is pounding in my chest. And I actually drifted off to sleep as my mind was screaming, screaming for answers. And the next thing I know, I had awakened the next morning to a still morning, and I got up, and I went to check my son, and I, I just thought that that was some kind of a dream. Must have been a dream. And it's interesting because I've, I've actually done a lot of radio, and so I have people who, you know, there's, there's recurring questions, and people always ask, well, how do you know it really happened? How do you know it wasn't a dream? Well, the first time, I didn't know. Maybe, maybe it is a dream. A bad one, too. A nightmare. And so I went about the business getting my son fed and doing the things that new mothers do. And that started me on a journey. Because for the next long while, three to four to five times a week, those lights and those sounds and that paranormal phenomena came visiting but I didn't have any visuals other than these bright lights through the ceiling. So in the darkness of my bedroom, as I was either asleep and then awakened, or just falling asleep, a sharply contrasted cone of bright white light would pierce the darkness through the ceiling and envelop me. And that's all I could really see, other than the phenomena of my hair blowing around my face and this very significant electromagnetic vibration, kind of like it would feel if you stuck your finger in a light socket. So there was all of this phenomena happening. It was painful. It was as though I was, I felt like I was being electrocuted. So I had no, no concept for what was happening. So... This started me on a journey. For a while, I thought I was maybe dreaming. As it continued, I started to wonder if the stress of my marital difficulties, the stress of being a new mother, I wondered if it was just really finally getting to me. And I started to go to the bookstore, read about poltergeists, read about ghosts, because I had no real visual at that point. And at the time, I was actually working. I was working for a physician of internal medicine in Century City, and I was billing supervisor. And my job was in a very, um, it was a very uh, plush office. The physician was considered, um, he was very well known. He donated, you know, children's wing, a children's wing to hospital. He was very wealthy. 
and this was this is where I was working at the time. So, as these this light show would come visiting, I would get my son off to to, to preschool, and then I would go off to work. And I was living this kind of a double life because my then husband had recently just gotten out of the military. He was an, he had been an officer. I really didn't feel comfortable discussing it with him at that point. Although I would kind of use kind of a concealed way of discussing it. For example, saying, what do you think about um, these people who, you know, hear lights and hear sounds that nobody can hear? And of course, the response wasn't that sympathetic. So I really didn't feel like discussing much more of, of my experiences at that point. I just wanted to wait and see. So the first indication that I had of something more concrete was my job at my employer's office was problematic. And what I mean by that is that as billing supervisor, my job was to look through the uh, medical charts and to bill insurance companies for medical services that had been performed. And I started to see discrepancies. And my, when I would ask my employer about them, he would say, just do your job and you don't really have all of the understanding as to what we do around here, but just do your job. Now, keep in mind, this was in 1987, before sexual harassment was that big of a deal. But as I would ask him questions, he would come in and kind of be inappropriate and basically just say, do your job. And I would discuss it with my husband, and what I discovered is that because this doctor was so well-respected, I was now, I, ha I felt like I was in this conundrum because my job was important to me and it was important to my, my husband. But I was, I felt that I was being asked to do something that wasn't ethical and perhaps even illegal. So one of the nights in which the light show came visiting, and keep in mind, sometimes I wasn't able to go back to sleep because sometimes the light show would happen and my eyes would close and I would have a sensation of movement, almost as though I was on a ride at Disneyland with my eyes closed and I would feel just like there was movement and there, was, there were these high-pitched sounds that I couldn't really distinguish something that was earthbound. <laughs> but on one of the many, many nights, I awoke to that telltale electromagnetic sound, like a zapping sensation. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and saw at the foot of my bed these two men. But they were kind of floating in the air. They were just regular-looking men. They were both wearing suits. They looked, they had these badges, and I, I was attempting to make it out. And keep in mind, my husband is asleep next to me in the bed, and I immediately tried to wake him up and show him Look, there's, there's these, these, look, you know, they're, they're, and he couldn't see anything. He basically said, you know, go back to sleep. Well, I continued to watch these two men, and it was like an apparition, but they were actually there, if you can imagine how I'm trying to explain this. They were in suits. They looked like they were wearing FBI badges, kind of, you know, from watching television. It looked like an FBI badge although I couldn't quite make it out. And they were having a conversation, and they were having a conversation about my workplace. So I listened, and they were talking about the doctor that I was working for. I'm thinking, what, you know, what, what delights and sounds and, and locomotives going through my bedroom and my hair blowing around the room, and I, I really started to wonder if I should get psychiatric help. But in the meantime... I was listening to these two men, and they were discussing my employer and how it was important that he be held accountable. Now, uh, here was, in my view, somebody, even though they were a, an apparent apparition, some two men that I really couldn't identify, to me it was important guidance, if you will. And I went back over a period of days and weeks, and basically said, um, I, I, can't, I can't continue to pretend that I'm 
doing this job because I was just filing them in the bottom of the cabinet. And to make a long story short, I, um, I, was, I was basically let go. And so what happened was I had, this, I had had this apparition of being given guidance, and this started an interesting phase in my life because what happened when I didn't know then, keep in mind, it would be many years before I actually saw what we would call an alien being associated with these electromagnetic sensations. But I look back and understand what happened, what was happening is that when I became exposed to these, this otherworldly phenomena, it was as though this drapery was pulled back on the universe. And I began to have second sight, but I didn't understand what that was. I hadn't really read any books about it. And so literally over a very short period of time, I would be walking down the street and I would pass somebody and I would hear their thoughts, although they weren't speaking to me. And I would start to have these other experiences where I would wake up in the middle of the night and I was actually having what I later would came to understand were described as um, the tunnel experience, like people describe when they're having a near-death experience. And so I was having these tunnel experiences spontaneously in the night. The electromagnetic uh, sensations would begin, light, there would be bright lights, I would have these tunnel experiences in which I seemed to enter this vortex of some kind. My eyes would often involuntarily close against my will. My heart would be thumping wildly in my chest. I wanted to know what was happening. And then I started to wake up at some later point. Now, as things progressed, I, I started to research everything that I could. I was looking at poltergeists. I was reading about ghosts. I was, I, I, you know, I, I, I think at that point, I think Whitley Strieber's book was out about communion with that scary alien on the cover. And I, it was like, it's just, that can't be happening to me. That's not it. And so I actually sought out a psychic. And she was actually very talented. I went to her house and there were actually celebrities there. And I, she was considered... She was very well respected. And she told me that I was being basically, um, that, that an exorcism was needed, that I had been contacted by some kind of an evil presence, and that I needed to do this, this, and this in order to free myself from this. So as things progressed and as I became more and more upset, my husband started to notice that I was, he, in, from his perspective, there was something going on that I wasn't talking about. And so finally, at one point, as, the, as our marriage worsened, he said to me, I think you should get some help. And I told him a few things. He saw books lying around the table on the occult, ghosts, poltergeists, and... I was lighting candles because this woman who was my mentor um, was saying light candles, take salt baths. I was doing everything and anything because I hadn't yet seen specifically what this presence was. And so my then husband recommended that I get an evaluation. So one night he drove me to a, a facility and I didn't really understand at the time that it was a psychiatric hospital. And I agreed to get an evaluation. I had actually had a significant um, injury, a shoulder injury. And so I was confused and I walked in and I, I wasn't 51 50 if you know what that is, where the police basically commit you. No judge had done that at that point. I walked in out of my own volition. My husband at the time did speak to the doctors. I didn't know what he said. And so this started a journey in which I actually couldn't get out. I was in the psychiatric hospital. Um, this was down in uh, down south. I don't even think it's there anymore. At the time, you know, I had excellent health insurance, and there was a practice with the business policy. You know, the business practices where if you had great insurance, they liked to keep you there, and they 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 tried to. 
So what happened was while I was in there, um, my husband went to court and said my wife is in a psychiatric hospital. So I lost custody of my ch of my child. And um, here I was in a psychiatric hospital, and I couldn't get out. And I still, keep in mind, really didn't know what was happening. I, <clears throat> I did wonder, maybe I'm just under a lot of stress. And so while I was in the hospital, I was a good patient. I went to, they had group, and I went to group, and there were there was just a plethora of all different kinds of diagnoses in there, meaning my my fellow patients. People were in there for um, addiction, alcohol and drug addiction, uh, all kinds of different things, bipolar, e everything and anything. And then I was in there also. So at some point, of course, I said, you know, it's time for me to go. But what I discovered is that I had a child custody hearing coming up in three weeks. And I was hoping that as if I was a good patient that they would allow me to go to this child custody hearing, but they had no such intention to allow me to leave in order to go to my own child custody hearing. So it was kind of a catch-22. I couldn't get out to the hearing, and I be really became desperate. And so, as it happened, in the middle of the night one night, I had another contact experience, or so I soon discovered. And at this, in this experience, I became aware that something that I was opening to some kind of a phenomena. And I decided to get out of there. At that point, I was still extremely disempowered in my life. I had fallen into the trap like sometimes we do where we believe that things just happen to us somehow. And so I didn't yet know that there is this amazing grand design in which we are participating, that there's some amazing, um, almost a council of elders that work with us, planning certain events, planning particular obstacles for us, setting us up to strengthen us. So I didn't know this yet. I didn't have a perspective on it yet. But I had an opportunity that came in the form of an orderly one night came into my room and started to grope me. Keep in mind, I'm a patient in a psychiatric hospital who can't get out. And in those days, there weren't cell phones. And there was a payphone, but they confiscate your, all of your personal items. I had no purse or no wallet. Um, in fact, when you take a shower, they take away, uh, you know, you're not allowed to use shampoo because people commit suicide with those kinds of things. So it was really a, a real psychiatric hospital. And so one night, an orderly came into my room and started to grope me. And I had had another experience while I was there, which invited me to look at the opportunity in so-called difficulties. And I, it gave me an idea. I had an idea. So from that so-called molestation, imagine the vulnerability of patients in a psychiatric hospital. I'm sure it goes on all the time. And so I went to the director of the hospital and explained what was going on. And as it, as it had happened before, just before I went into the hospital, I actually um, filed a complaint with the Department of Insurance Fraud with the good doctor that I had been working for. And so all events conspired is this amazing timing in which while I was um, during this whole period, it actually came to, he came to be, um, um, the, the grand jury did a whole investigation on him. So I went to with this man uh, molesting me, I went to the director of the hospital and I identified myself as having been groped in the night. He den he's denied all possibility. And I basically said that if you don't let me out of here, I'm going to go to the LA Times and <clears throat> write a whole um, kind of expose on what's going on in here. 
So he signed me out. I got to my child custody hearing, and I regained custody of my son. And I now I'm out. I'm out of the hospital. And now what, right? I mean, I'm at the point where I had lost everything. My home, my job, my really my self-respect. And I'm now sharing custody of my son with my husband. And I'm attempting to rebuild my life. Now, interestingly enough, because there had been alcoholism in my childhood, in my family, and I knew the kind of pain that it caused children, I really didn't, I, I really wanted to know if I had a thought disorder. I really, I really did want to know because I was motivated to not repeat certain things that I had seen in my own neighborhood. Children down the street had just horrible experiences with violent alcoholic parents. And I was not drinking and I was not doing drugs, but if I was crazy, I felt that that couldn't be very good for my son. So I discovered a psychotherapist. He's actually still in practice. His name is Alan Ludington. He's in Westlake. And I basically signed up for counseling. I said, I want to know if I'm nuts. Now, keep in mind, I still really haven't gotten an absolute handle on all of my experiences and what is happening with me. And so I started this therapeutic process. I started individual therapy once a week. In addition, I was invited to participate in group counseling. And the group counseling involved... Um, being in a group with several uh, psychotherapists, including psychologists, psychiatrists, and marriage and family therapists, and other, about uh, eight to ten other adults. And I was evaluated, as were everybody, and I submitted to this process for a total of six years because I, I wanted to know. And I was given a lot of the standardized Western testing, and I was also, you can imagine the kind of, um, because I was willing to just, 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 I'm an open book. And so at the end, but here's, here was the most interesting point to this. About two years into that therapy, I started to gain the confidence that I wasn't crazy and that I had opened to something extraordinary. And so even though I had this intense fear and it wasn't just intense fear of the experiences. I was actually afraid of, well, uh, of life. I was just afraid. How am I going to pay the bills? You know, supposing I get sick. All the kind of the normal fears that we have. And at that point, I really shifted into a state of curiosity. And what do you suppose happened? As soon as I was curious the experiences started up in real earnestness. So I now was experiencing the strong electromagnetic sensations in the middle of the night. The cone of light would burst through the ceiling and envelop me completely. Sometimes I would involuntarily open my mouth to scream in terror, but nothing would come out of my mouth. And instead of my eyes closing... My eyes remained open, and I saw for the first time. The, the first time that something was actually clear for a while, meaning I didn't just see snippets. I saw my body floating. I, my eyes closed and then reopened. I had the sensation of great movement as though I were riding in some kind of... I, I really didn't know. I just felt that my body was moving. And at one point, I awoke to see my own body floating through the air, and I was on some kind of in some kind of a craft. And people always ask me, well, what did it look like? It was just a craft. I was, my heart was beating. I could hear my heart beating, and I wondered if I was going to have a heart attack. As I was floating through this craft, my feet started to descend like this. And I went through, I passed through this narrow opening of a portal down to some kind of a ground on the bottom. And before me, I beheld several of these alien 
beings. And they were actually spectacularly beautiful. And I've tried to capture the, the image on, on the, my latest book called Above and Beyond. That's the way they appeared to me. This beautiful, almost translucent, dolphin-like skin, outer skin. And these large, the traditional large, black, wraparound eyes. They were about four foot tall. But what I discovered over, you know, over many, many years is that they, as do we as spiritual beings, have the ability to shape shift. And so they can look all different kinds of ways. And they do. That's one of the interesting mysteries of in my understanding, alien contact, is that when one evolves and when one is able to use matter in the way that evolved beings do, you can change your appearance. And I actually will we'll, we'll start, you know, I, I want to talk about the greater point of what this all means, what it meant to me. And it's interesting because as I beheld them in front of me, they started to talk to me. And it wasn't for a few minutes passing that I realized that nobody's mouth was moving. They had the classic, you know, the very thin slit of a mouth. Their mouths were not moving, and nor was mine. And there was this conversation, but what was the most extraordinary aspect of that amazing moment was that I knew that I knew them. I knew that I had seen them when I was seven. I knew that I had seen them before this particular lifetime. Now keep in mind, at the time, I was not a woman who believed in reincarnation. I didn't necessarily give it any thought. It wasn't a real concept to me. But at that moment, as I beheld them, I knew a lot in a moment. I remembered them from eons. I understood that I was, that they were actually family, that this was a great and grand reunion. And there was a tremendous sense of love. There was a tremendous outpouring of almost homesickness. And from that point forward, more became known to me. From that point forward, I started to have regular adventures, if you will, lacking any better word. Although it's still, it's like Steve said in the beginning, you know, is it is it contact or is it paranormal or is it is it ghosts? Is it near death? And what I came to realize is that I had been exposed to the energy of the universe somehow. And when that happened, I was exposed to all of it in a moment. And so I was began to regularly have this tunnel experiences where it appeared as though I was dying, just like the classic NDE, the classic near-death experience. And yet I would appear, where would I appear? I would appear in the interlife the life between lives. And I don't mean to tread on any religious beliefs. I'm only going to tell you what I, the truth that I have for me. And I've spent a tremendous amount of time, even though there's really no time there, but a tremendous amount of my experiences exploring this interlife experience. And the most staggering part of it is that we are all here, particularly people who have an interest in anything UFO, who have an interest or a curiosity, memories from childhood, longings for contact, dreams about contact, dreams about otherworldly beings, we are all part of a group who is not necessarily limited to incarnating here on planet Earth. And so, of course, we have these memories that surface. Many of us, like myself, I have waking experiences 
with otherworldly beings, beings that I have incarnated with previously, in other locations, there are many, many places to incarnate, aside from just this planet. Most people who, in, this is from, this is all that I have been shown, but most, the majority of people who incarnate on planet Earth do so for most of their lives. This is one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult training program available. It's why it's in such demand. So those of us who are here are doing great, great work. It may seem at times grossly discouraging when I discovered that the great majority of those incarnating on earth are relatively new souls. And we know what new we know how new souls behave. I mean, we just have to visit a kindergarten class, right? Or hang out with a bunch of you know seven-year-old boys. People are, you know, young souls are into their own agenda. Young souls don't understand the nuances of compassion and forgiveness. Young souls don't have a sense of accountability. And so what I learned is that my contact served as an opening to a life which is happening constantly, but we agree to forget when we're born into it. When we are born here to parents that we've tremendous amount of planning goes into the choice of parent, parents and family. Tremendous amount of coordination, of planning. All kinds of issues are considered. We each have a wise counsel. And those of us who are harmonizer souls, meaning souls who work with beings who don't regularly incarnate here, they incarnate elsewhere. We have this fluidity of ability to almost transmigrate dimensions. And so in the same way that when people drop their body, and we call it dying, they drop their body, they don't have to go very far. The tunnel effect opens up right in front of the person. And so they're having this amazing transitional experience, but they, it's happening everywhere, which means why we don't have to go to, say, you know, Machu Picchu to have a contact experience. If we can transition out of this life and into another one, into the interlife right where we are, we can also have these remarkable paranormal experiences with otherworldly beings and with our own counsel and with our own guides, and we do. And because we have agreed to forget when we're born, and there's the, the, it's the grand design, because we have agreed to forget, most of us do, we forget. We forget about what we came here to do. We forget that the recurring, the repetition of problems, the one problem that seems to come again and again and again in different forms, that is the work to be done. So when I met my own wise elders, and when I understood the accountability that occurs, there's no, there's no punishment. This is the punishment, no, no. It's actually not a punishment. The, if there's no punishment for wrongdoing in the way that we have been taught to believe. For those, of course, who have been involved in evil acts, there is a special rehabilitation for those souls. But for the rest of humanity who is attempting to evolve, there's a certain rhythm to that evolution. So I was shown the nature of that rhythm. And all so-called an apparent 
grief and loss, a lot of it has been pre-chosen. Many, many people who have handicaps, physical handicaps, gender difficulties with all, all, any kind of issue that has that, in which a person is struggling with being accepted by society, these are often tremendous opportunities. Yeah, obviously, something that offers more obstacles than something else produces more growth. And so we're all here taking part in this amazing adventure and we're thrown into a group of people who have all different levels of spiritual attainment. So it would be as though we are going to school and the first graders and the PhDs are all thrown in together. And that's, what's, that's, the, that's the environment that we're in. And so sometimes we get lost in the ain't it awfuls, the difficulties that we face. And from what I understand, having seen it, you know, as part of the evidence for me was being shown lives that I had lived and seeing the same thread of challenges through lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. So perhaps I am wanting to look at all the faces of powerlessness or I'm wanting to understand really what forgiveness is. Because how can you know what forgiveness is unless you have been wronged? How can you know all the facets of compassion unless you have been harmed. And so we volunteer for these assignments and then we forget that we have volunteered. And we often bemoan our struggles forgetting this amazing, incredible support system that we have and those of us who have either had contact experiences or have had some kind of opening to some kind of paranormal phenomena, it serves as evidence, really, of the grandiosity of the universe. And we continue, most of us continue to come back here because it has all of it. It has the, the great, great beauty and the joy so we, and we've got love, and yet we have one of the most competitive environments in, you know, in this part of the galaxy. And so new souls have a tremendous, tremendously difficult time adapting. I'm talking about people who are here for the first time, the fifth time, the tenth time. It's a really, it's, it's, it's a really difficult transition for new souls. But we forget when we see this kind of acting out that that's exactly what it is. So as my experiences progressed, I was shown more and more spontaneously, almost as though a video player had started, in which I saw other lives of mine. I saw concurrent themes. People in my life now family members or significant others or relatives or specific co-workers, employers, all key people in my life, they were a running theme in my life. Lives. And so we would come back together again and again. Of course, these aren't new concepts, but what's interesting is that so-called aliens bring one to the threshold of our universal identity. And that's, for, for me, has been so exhilarating. And just as I started to get a handle on it, like, this is amazing, I began to understand that then, you know, as we believe that we have mastered something, as we believe that we have mastered some struggle in our life, we're given a little bit more of it. 
to test what we know. And I was at the period in my life, about, what was it, six years ago, when I was, I felt I had really started to master some of these concepts. Forgiveness, compassion, understanding, self-empowerment. And I was looking for just the right experience to increase my training. And I came across an opportunity in which I became a caregiver to a woman who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And I wrote a book about the experience. Some of you saw it. It's called Difficult People, A Gateway to Enlightenment. And people ask me, what on earth does difficult, what do difficult people have to do with aliens? The connection is that it's a training. And I understood it as such. And so as I started to work with a woman with Alzheimer's who loathed me, her brain had been affected by her disease, I shuttled her to doctor appointments, and I started to really delve into the trenches of the experience and put into practice all that I had learned. So it served as a sort of, in my own evolution now, on, in this incarnation, it served as my kind of PhD program. And it was difficult. And so I write about some of the strategies because really it's all it is. From my understanding, the ET contact for me served as a... They've actually been way showers for me. How do we do this crazy thing called life on planet Earth? How do we do this thing? The give and the take, the up and the down, the joy and the heartache. As we grow older and we feel the sensation of our bodies changing. And so we are all offered this amazing opportunity, but it is all done in the context of these amazing, wonderful and lovely and evolved beings who help supervise our progress. And as we drop our bodies, oh, meaning as we die, we're just moving into a different location. Of course, the near-death experience <clears throat> literature has already described for us what that is. We already, the literature shows what is also my experience. There's a life review done in absolute compassion. We know what it feels like to be in the shoes of the people that we have harmed. And then we choose again after we have evaluated over quite, a, quite thoroughly, after we have evaluated what we have just done with our lives. Why, the wheres, the wherefores, the hows. And we are able to look at alternative paths. We can experience, if, if I had done this, what would have happened differently? So we, we learn and review what we have just experienced, and then we choose again. And we're born again. And we come back having complete amnesia, forgetting all that we have agreed to. And our wonderful, the soul group that we come back to, some of them, some of these beings we have been with for since the beginning of our existence. Imagine that. People that we love and people that we hate <laughs> have been with us since the beginning of our existence. If they're in our immediate soul group, we also agree to come back with people and have significant relationships with people that are not in our immediate soul group, but in a secondary group in order to bring a certain lesson. It's a training. It's like the Marines, but only better. And so here we are. We have help along the way. Some of us have been made aware of those helpers 
Those guides can look like alien beings, they can look like human beings, but because we have a spiritual heritage, we have many, many similarities with beings who are much more evolved than we are. So, for example, that part about the shape-shifting, well, each lifetime we look very different. We take turns coming back into all different kinds of experiences. When we are choosing a life of great wealth or great opportunity or great power, those might look like easy lifetimes when we look at those other people who have those lifetimes. But those lifetimes are also in which we are testing to see if we are seduced into the very seductive pull of holding an authoritarian power over others. And so each lifetime offers some remarkable opportunity for training. And they tend to come in repetition in each lifetime. So the same problem that you're having, you notice that seems to keep seems to keep recurring. And we're all looking for our purpose, right? We're all looking for our purpose. Sometimes a, a grand purpose is simply to find a way to be in harmony with the people that we're dealing with. And so as my, my experience with this woman who had Alzheimer's, her name was Jeanette, continued. I struggled. I learned. I found a way to go deeper inside myself. I Obviously, I wrote a book about it, explaining how that is actually a metaphor a metaphor for all of life, because who doesn't have difficult people in their life? And I thought I had just a whole team of difficult people in my life. And all of the things that I needed came to me. So I met, I worked with a famous author who introduced me to his publisher, who then published my books. And so, interestingly enough, if you've come here tonight, if you've been, you had a, just a sense that you should be here, it's a very great chance that you are a harmonizer soul, meaning that you also incarnate in certain lifetimes elsewhere, that part of your soul group are other beings who are not human beings, And sometimes those memories and sometimes those experiences are difficult. And I'm, I'm well aware of the, the literature on the, the so-called alien abduction model. And somebody here asked me, and I wanted to respond to the question, somebody asked me, Lisette, are you a, what was the question, are you a, a multiple abductee, right? Thank you for asking me that because it gives me an opportunity to respond. Of course, an abduction implies a kidnapping, but I don't feel that I've been kidnapped. And I understand that people have difficult experiences in this realm and another, but how do we come to terms with the fact that some of us are in abusive relationships and others are in loving relationships. And so people ask me, well, wait a minute, so you, you're lucky, Lisette, you know the friendly aliens, but this guy over here has got the mean aliens. What on earth is going on? Well, remember, planet Earth is populated by billions of people and we're all in different levels of spiritual attainment. So we're going to come up against everybody. We're going to meet the Mother Teresas. We're going to meet the, the Saddam Husseins. We're going to meet the narcissists, the selfish, the compa We're going to meet everybody. 
Oh, you mean, does that include otherworldly beings too? Well, why not? Because planet Earth is reflective of what's going on everywhere. There's all different kinds of levels of spiritual attainment. So how can it be that we've got, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, and then we've got Hitler, we've got all, and everything in between. So some of us have loving spouses and others say that we're getting divorced and we're running screaming into the night. And yet there is something going on. There is some amazing general plan. There's a grand plan to all of those beings that we meet, whether worldly or otherworldly. I personally have had a lot of different what you might call so-called victimizing experiences. And yet, in my interlife experiences, how on earth could it be that I actually planned to have it? That just, that just blew my mind. No, really. I mean, really. Like, really? I wanted to marry the man that I married, my first husband, and then to be shown that he was the same person in another life, in which there was a, a victimizing relationship, victimizer and victim. I lost my voice, so to speak. And so he volunteered to play this role again. And I volunteered to come in with complete amnesia. Well, why? If there's such wisdom, why do we have to forget everything? Well, the same way if any of you attended any kind of schooling, they don't, you know, when you're taking a test, you're not given the answers. If you have the answers, it's cheating. So we come in with these experiences, we forget that it's a designed strategy to help strengthen our souls. Because when we're born, we come in with our soul mind that merges with the human brain. The human brain is chosen for whatever purposes our elders believe that, and we believe in conjunction with them that we want to work on. So there, there's not, there are no accidents like that. So we come in, we have amnesia, and we work, the soul mind works attempting to integrate with the human brain. And the human brain is the analytical mind. We know what that is, right? The analytical mind is that which is judging, is condemning is making everybody wrong, is saying this is terrible, is afraid, is fearful. And so our responsibility is to remember that our purpose is to just do what's in front of us with grace and courage. Now, are any of you wondering if there are aliens in the room? <laughs> the abduction experiences. Well, what would you say if I told you that the abductions, the abduction experiences, were entryways to a universal experience? And so the abductions, and there have been thousands of them. Communications me asking questions, but ultimately when I understood that they are so spiritually evolved and that they can shapeshift, for example, if you ask me well, what do they look like, how do I answer that question? Well, I can tell you what they look like this second, but then the next second they're going to look di differently. And so my so-called contact experiences were both in this realm, sometimes they appear and they 
they appear as though there's a cheesecloth. There's, they're, they're almost as though they're still in this other dimensional experience, and yet I'm here. Other times, for example, the, the experience that I described on the craft, I, I was in the flesh. This was not like a... This was not in which my physical body was on the bed and, and my soul body was elsewhere. This was my physical body. It was a face-to-face contact experience in the flesh. I, I can't understand, I can't explain how that happened. I've had conversations with physicists who've said, it's not possible. Extraterrestrial beings, it's not possible for, for them to visit planet Earth. Okay, that's fine. I, I, that's fine. That understanding is fine with me. But wanting contact is as simple as understanding that it's to some degree, if you're drawn to this field, you've probably already had it, either in this realm or another, or that otherworldly beings are working with you through your dream, dreams or your thoughts, encouraging you and giving you inspirations. Okay, Lisette, uh, thank you so much for uh, coming here tonight. Let's give her a nice round of applause.